no idea if this stream is going to work. Um, I'm outside right now at the cottage. That's that's Lake Huron in the back. We're right back onto the lake just behind that gully. You know, there's a big dip back there, but um, the internet out here, terrible. So I have no idea whether or not it's gonna work. That's why I came on a couple of minutes early. I thought, hey, I'm gonna you know do a little test here and make sure it's working. So if anyone does get this um, announcement, I know I'm a few minutes early here, but if anyone gets this and jumps on, can you let me know if you can hear me first off, if, is it actually working over the Wi-Fi? Um, Again, we're using super laggy internet. They're actually bringing fiber out to the cottages in here, um, interestingly, in the next three weeks. So hopefully, in the next two or three streams, I can provide you some, some better um, quality here. So, And if you can hear the waves, sorry about the wind and the waves. I don't know if you guys can, can hear that or not. Um, and I'm sitting on a little kid's Muskoka's chair. <laughs> it's like this big, and there's a little kid's picnic table here. I don't have the proper accommodations, but we're making it work. We are making it work live from the cottage. As you guys know from last week's stream, I sold my house and uh, we're waiting for our new house to close in a couple of weeks here and we're getting to basically have a nice vacation at uh, the cottage here. So we're really enjoying it. It's been a great, fantastic week. Um, okay. Andrew, okay, so if people can hear me, it sounds good. Um, they can hear me, good. Um, hey Mike, hope you're doing well. Can hear you loud and clear. Okay, cool. I'm like, yes, I can hear you as well. Good, good. Um, I wanna start the stream off, assuming it doesn't cut out and assuming I can continue to stream. I may have to jump onto LTE in a second here, um, but uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. I wanna talk at first about the value of real estate in a portfolio, because I think you know, the last couple of episodes I've talked you know, uh, at nauseum about how much I like options trading and crypto and other investment like buying private businesses and private lending you know over the last year or two you've seen me talk about that on the channel because there's other avenues you can invest in besides real estate in fact you can invest in businesses and within uh, lending and using debt within real estate as well so you can touch on real estate without actually having to physically manage the real estate and there's you know some great alternatives like REITs that exist as well but I want to talk about how real estate should I think in your portfolio act like bonds does in a portfolio. So bonds typically, you know, you know, people recommend between, you know, I hear anywhere from a 5% bond allocation of your portfolio up to 25%. You know, a lot of the, you know, you go into a bank and you have a bank set a portfolio for you, of, you know, mutual funds or whatever. And they'll throw, typically, if you're, if you say you're low risk, they'll go 60% equities, 40% fixed income. And most of that fixed income will be, you know, T-bills and you know, maybe municipal, local bonds, some corporate bonds. Maybe you want, if you're a little bit higher risk, they'll throw some junk bonds in the mix, but it's bonds. And I don't like bonds. I never have liked bonds. The value in having a fixed income piece in your portfolio is the stability of being able to cash it. Well, one, it tends to be very flat. Um, two, it tends to be flat with a small amount of growth, hopefully outpacing inflation, which we haven't seen over the last couple of years. And your buying power has been eroded within um, bonds and fixed income. but uh, there is a play there. When equities dip during times of recession and times of turmoil, bonds tend to be consistent. And so you can typically liquidate, let's say you're a 60-40 split, you typically liquidate some of your bond holdings, which have remained steady throughout the recession. Uh, typically, you'll liquidate those and be able to get into equities at 20, 30, 40% discount and then rebalance again back into bonds as the market recovers. So typically that fixed income piece, the argument for it is that you can use it in times of recession to double down. In the same way I talk about margin on your trading account, you should use that for, um, you know, I think it's really critical to use that for those dips. That's really the time to, to you know, hunker down and, and use all that available cheap debt that you have at places like, you know, interactive brokers. My favorite brokerage platform, you've heard me talk about it, again, at nauseum. But honestly, there's no other platform in Canada that's, that's better where you can borrow you know, a couple million dollars, you can borrow 70% loan to value on all your blue chip companies, use it to buy real estate, use it to buy more stocks, whatever you want. Um, effectively, you can go 3.34 to, to one times. If you insured your portfolio, you could go all the way. Uh, I don't recommend that, but in times of recession, it's a good time to maybe double down. If you have a million dollars in stocks, maybe double down and go two and a half million or two million in stock portfolio when everything's down, like during crypto, um, or sorry, during uh, COVID crash, uh, there was a time where crypto was on big discount. Uh, there was a time where, and crypto you can't lever as well using interactive brokers, that's a bad example, but a lot of the, the big bank stocks, as an example, you can lever those up to the tits, 3.34 to one, or 70% loan to value, you can borrow against them repeatedly. 
Um, so that's kind of a cool you know, hack to be able to expose yourself to those underpriced equities in those times of, of pullback, right? So why do I like real estate in your portfolio? Um, one is I like that, like buying private businesses, you can find ways to milk or exploit a competitive advantage that you can't do in public equities. Now, you can, so someone asked a question here, something about active trading. I didn't read the whole question yet, but can you explain why you actively trade? What probability do you have about performing an index after factoring an active income corporate tax rate? So Harry, I'll address that in a second here, um, maybe partly with this, this question as well. So, um, and then circle back to real estate in the same way I think that um, there's, okay, so in the options market where they're selling puts or you can buy puts or they're selling calls and you can buy calls, you can do vertical spreads as well, which means your downside is capped and your upside is capped. Sometimes the market gets irrational. Um, two days back, I believe it was Monday, the market kind of had a falling out. If you guys remember, it was like a, um, the S&P was down 2%. Every big name was down between one and 10%, uh, even blue chip stuff. And so it was a great time to load up. Reason for that is in the options market, a one or 2% drop, sometimes for a short period of time leads to 40, 50, 80% change in premiums. The market makers come in to try to provide liquidity, um, but it, basically things are crazy, right? And so there are times where you can put, um, you know, order contracts out there where you agree to buy, like, as an example, on Monday, I sold a ton of puts. I did some put spreads. I did short some stuff that was way up. AMC, as an example, I wrote vertical, bear call spreads defined, defined between, I think it was like between 40 and 42. So if it's, you know, if it's over 42, I'm capped off, stop loss, two bucks a share, that's it. But if it's under 40, when it expires, I get, I think it was paying almost $1.80 a share. So like, if you look at that, the probability of me losing up to $2 a share is the max loss, and I'm getting paid $1.80 to take that gamble. It's almost guaranteed it's not gonna be between 40 and 42. So the, the probability of profit is so high and the risk is so low that writing contracts like that, you know, on those crazy days can provide you 100% annualized return. Now those days aren't all the time. And when those days happen, you gotta drop everything and chase those, those premiums, right? And you've, again, do not be stupid and write naked calls or even naked puts. I think doing vertical spreads is super key to cap your downside, but take advantage of the market's irrationality. If you just, and you could just do this with all bull put spreads if you wanted to, which means the worst case scenario is you get, if it falls between that small range that you're get, um, you're insuring, you get the shares at that price. So write it at a, you know, at a price that you're okay owning it. Like maybe, you know, if Apple's trading 140 a share, you say, hey, at 120 a share, I'm okay owning Apple shares. I'll write some contracts where if it's between 120 and 125, I own the shares. Otherwise I get the premiums for free. Those types of um, active writing of contracts, it makes a lot of sense. Um, especially if you're focused on the long term, you can, here's where you can't do it with a, lar a large fund can't do it because there isn't that much liquidity in vertical spreads. Like the amount of orders being filled is, is very small. You, you couldn't give me a hundred million or $500 million and ask me to replicate the same returns I'm getting with a few million dollars. It's in a couple hundred thousand dollars is even easier because you don't need to get very many contracts accepted. Uh, and because there's so much volatility, sometimes you'll see in one day, you know, at a certain strike price, 30 to 40, 50% variation throughout the day. So you could set an order and be ready for when one of those days happens and boom, your contract will get you know, um, executed and you'll be, you'll be laughing. And you could, the next day, typically you can just rotate that, you can just sell that contract off for a 50% realized profit. So I do that often where like the next, you know, you often see there'll be a down day and an up day, down day and an up day. On the down days, I'll just typically sell, um, you know, I'll be bullish and on the up days, you know, I don't tend to like to short the market. I only like to short stuff that has really bad fundamentals. And even then, you know, like Newegg was an example of where I got eviscerated. I got destroyed. My portfolio almost got evaporated by like 20 something percent, um, you know, in, in a, the short order of a couple hours. And that's because I removed my hedge. That was a mistake. I shouldn't, I should have put, <laughs> put the hedge back on at the top, which is a huge mistake. Um, I am not pretending to be a professional trader. I do not know what I'm doing. Um, I'm muddying through it just like everyone else. I just look for opportunities to, um, you know, to write contracts to buy, you know, a nice balanced portfolio. Typically, I'll sell contracts on the S and P 500. Like, you could just sell puts on the S and P 500 weeklies if you wanted to, on the S and P on like Spy as an example on the S and P 500 and make like half a percent a week with very little risk. The worst case scenario is you own the index. Like, you get assigned the shares in the index that you wanted to hold anyway in your long term portfolio. 
And instead of just owning the shares and tying up all that equity, for a lot less of your equity, you can write contracts or you can sell puts or put spreads if you're, you know, you wanna cap your downside in case there's a, and I think that's smart by the way, you should always be capping the downside because what if there is a huge pullback and a huge recession? It's nice to have those puts that you bought to protect the puts that you sold so then you can sell those puts that you bought at the bottom and double down on the S&P 500 when it's down at its worst. Because long-term we know that the S&P 500 is gonna continue to roar at six to 8% on average. Over a 10 year period, you'll have about one and a half times doubled. In a good market like we've seen, you get two times doubled over 10 years. So every five years, it's doubling. Um, now, there could be times of, you know, where it's down. You don't care if you're writing contracts at certain set prices. The worst case scenario, you set yourself up to be assigned stuff you want to own anyway. That's what I like to do. I think, you know, from what I've seen, I've been following a few friends of mine who've been doing this for a long time. And I have one friend who's been doing it for like eight years. And he's consistently outperformed the market for eight years. Like, it's just better in most cases to write contracts, options contracts, than it is to actually own the shares. Now there are situations where if it, you know, if you bought the shares and then it, the company skyrocketed, of course you would have been better off buying the shares. But in, you know, where things trade sideways and there's a lot of volatility, the contracts actually pay better typically. So that's why I like it. Another reason is it's an active, um, active trading is again, a better preferred tax rate. You're paying 12% tax, 12.9% uh, tax in an active corp, as opposed to paying you know, potentially a lot more for dividends. Dividend income at the top marginal bracket here in Canada is just under 40% effective tax rate if you're at the top marginal bracket. Now, you guys know I've done videos, you make $50,000 and your spouse makes $50,000 in just dividend income, that's totally tax-free because the way that you get the tax credits back from the tax the corp already paid, um, you get that credit back, that's pretty sweet. Um, again, if you're building a really lean early retirement portfolio and you plan to be you know, not having any of their income sources and you just wanna build a dividend portfolio, it's awesome. It's super sweet. Um, I'm in a position where, you know, I'm, I'm always gonna be in the top marginal tax bracket, probably. Um, so it, dividends make less and less sense for me. That said, I, I like dividend plays. I like the consistency of the cash flow. I do have a dividend portfolio, but the tax efficiency is actually worse for me at my top marginal bracket than capital gains. I actually prefer capital gains. And then I prefer active, you know, options contracts over that. The active options contracts, I can hire an employee, um, there's a lot of conferences I can go to. I could travel the world and build a business around the active trading. And that's cool because you get a lot of du deductions against that income and the income's active. So you can then write off, you know, everything against it and be preferred in the 12, you know, 12.9% tax rate. So there are some advantages to being an active trader. Um, you know, once you exceed the $500,000 per corp, then I think capital gains makes more sense. Um, I also just have fun trading. Like I genuinely enjoy, it feels like, gambling in a lot of ways for me and it's not even gambling it's like I, I don't actually like the feeling of gambling i go into a casino and i i don't like it um it feels like what i can do in real estate and i'm going to pivot back to why real estate is so awesome is that high that you get when you find something under value or under market and the market hasn't caught up to it yet it happens all the time there's misinformation um, there are tons of value opportunities that exist the mar there's too much information going on right now anyone who says they can predict you know, the stock market, they can't, right? There's a, there's a rationality. And so when you jump into those irrational, well, those market times where the market is irrational, same in real estate. You can go talk to grandma, she'll sell you a house at a 30% discount. That happens in the real world. I buy properties under market value all the time. So what things are trading at on in the real estate world, there's, again, limited liquidity leads to this. Again, in the options market, limited liquidity also leads to these opportunities as well because the big hedge funds can't go in and do the same vertical spreads I can. They have too much capital to deploy. They never, the market makers would never fill their orders. So it, again, it's an opportunity to exploit basically. Um, and, and then that's what it's all about at the end of the day is finding those opportunities. And it, it's a high when you find them. The problem in real estate is when I find those opportunities, I need a partner to do all the work because typically those opportunities come with um, follow-up or headache afterwards. So those opportunities by grandma's house, it's also dated. So now we need to go in and renovate it. We have to go in and maybe you know, deal with some tenant issues. We have to go in and deal with some neighbor issues or some city bylaw issues, whatever. There's a fight. There's something going on at that property. Typically, there's issues. Even the best of properties have issues with them and there's time related to that. Whereas in the options market, I spend zero time. So even if I make a higher return in real estate, I prefer options myself personally because I have a large capital base that I can grow faster with less time at scale at better scale now eventually i understand that i'm just going to have to at a certain point my portfolio is going to be focused purely on capital gains and i'll be too large to be doing you know just options trading but at the stage i'm at right now 
I can do it. If I had $500 million, I, I couldn't. I could do a small section in options portfolio, but the rest of it would probably be you know, buying private businesses or you know, just investing in, in good equities that I believe have good long-term upside, right? And again, real estate should be part of that portfolio. I wanna circle back to that because there's a few advantages in real estate. One, your primary residence can be an amazing, amazing opportunity to allow you to have a home base that can grow and appreciate levered you know, if you have a mortgage on it, you can be levered. If you put 20% down, you're levered five to one. So levered five to one at a 2% cost of debt on an asset that appreciates tax-free. Here in Canada, if you buy a house for hundred grand and it sells for $10 million 20 years from now, that's all tax-free. There's no cap on it. You could buy a house for hundred thousand dollars. It becomes worth $10 million because inflation goes crazy and the market appreciates, whatever, make up whatever reasons you want. But that's an amazing tax vehicle. So everyone should own their primary residence um, or have a primary residence that they or somewhere they designate as a primary residence. Maybe buy a cottage, designate that as your primary residence. Have a second house you know, in the city, if you wanna come into the city for work or whatever, and rent that, okay. Because I, I get that it doesn't make sense to own in some areas where the rent to price ratios don't make sense. Okay, I get that argument. I've thought through it. Um, I can see it. But the tax vehicles, I think, are, are key. Um, also, I love real estate as, you know, real estate is really one of those vehicles that you can lever up super safely where you can go five to one leverage on it and there'll be no margin calls. Here in Canada, the, the banks just don't margin call. You make your payments, doesn't matter. They're not gonna margin call you. They're already conservative enough. So that's one thing that's really nice about real estate is you can lever up really well with no margin call. It still is the best asset class next to businesses. And private businesses are even better than real estate. Um, but they're harder to find those opportunities and they're more work to manage and to buy an active business, you know, integrate all the employees and systems and turn that around. Um, you know, I, I think that's, that's something that you can't replicate in the public markets in the same way. I do know traders that make, you know, and take, they take, you know, more risk, I would say. And again, it's an active job, like from, you know, eight to five, that's all they're, maybe even like six to six, all they're doing is watching technical analysis and they're, you know, they're writing, you know, vertical spreads and whatever, but they're taking more risk in doing that. And they could get, you know, potentially wiped out if something ever happened. But I know people who have gone 10 years and they've got like a thousand percent higher return over those 10 years than the indexes. So people do do it for long periods of time, but not with large capital bases and large funds can't do it. Something like 90, 99% or 95%, I can't remember the exact stat, but a large majority of all of the active mutual funds, net of fees do not outperform the index. So that should tell you that if Wall Street can't outperform the index net of fees, and net of fees is a big piece because there's a lot of fees that are built in. But, and they compound against you. You know, every 15 years, the mutual fund takes one of your doubles away. So over a lifetime, they take four or five of your doubles away. That's huge. You could have potentially four or five times the wealth if you didn't go with mutual funds. Um, so I hate mutual funds, but I can see their purpose. And I can understand how the fees paid to the advisors, the advisors could bring enough value that they're justified. You know, over your lifetime, it could add more than four to five times to your total wealth trajectory if you're the average person. So. I hear the arguments on both sides, having been a financial advisor at a certain point. I'm not you know, licensed anymore, and this is just my opinions. Do whatever you want with them. But uh, I do think real estate, you know, despite not having great liquidity, what I mean by that is like it takes a while to, today if I decide to sell a house, I have to prepare it for sale, which could take you know, anything, anywhere from days to weeks to months by the time photographers get in there and get it all listed. And then there's like a listing period of a couple weeks in the market, and then typically a 30 to 90 day escrow closing before you actually get the cash. So to actually you know, dispose of a, a real estate asset, there's a long time. Whereas a stock I liquidate tomorrow morning and plus two days and it's settled. It's in my account, I'm good. Um, that's huge, right? Like, I mean, interactive brokers, they would see that immediately and I'd have cash to, I could borrow the cash if I wanted to. So I didn't even have to wait the two days. But you know, basically it's two days to settle. So the liquidity difference of owning real estate that's publicly traded versus owning you know, private properties that you can you know, buy and build in the portfolio, that's a big, I think, con, but I get over that by realizing that I can lever five to one, no margin call, super cheap debt, and the biggest piece with your own private real estate portfolio is, and this can also be a double-edged sword, by the way. I know people, and I'm gonna make the point, here it is. So the point is, you're in control of the management, which can be a pro or a con. I know lots of people who have gotten into real estate and properties sat vacant for six months or a year, myself even. I had so many projects on the go that I've had properties sit for months before contractors actually got to them. I've had you know, properties sit with tenant issues for like a year before I got to actually battling it out in court and whatever. It can be years 
of no cash flow. So you gotta remember in real estate, it's kind of like a bond if you, you know, bought a nice multi-unit that's cash flowing at day one or whatever and things go well, but you could buy real estate as well and you could go two years where it's just like you're losing two grand a month every single month for two years and then you get a huge payout at the end. So in some ways it acts like a bond, in other ways it doesn't. So it depends on the type of real estate that you're buying too. Um, people get into it and they don't know what they're doing and they make mistakes and that's part of the learning journey. I've made tons of mistakes too. But in aggregate, a large you know, REIT type portfolio, if you could build that yourself, would be diversified and safe. And if you had good management in place, then it would be cash flow positive and operate in a lot of the same ways as um, bonds. But here's where I like the bond piece. I, I said at the start of this, I titled this video, um, you know, real estate over bonds or something like that. I, I can't remember exactly what I put, but real estate in your portfolio as opposed to bonds. I like private lending in the sp as private mortgages against Canadian solid real estate in areas that I like. I like that over bonds. I can go out in the market right now, reach out to some local, you know, if you go to your, your local real estate meetup groups, wherever you live, doesn't matter, there's probably a meetup group. You go there or join a local, you know, online group and say, hey, I'm looking to lend against, you know, flips. I'm looking to lend against quality real estate. I'll go 75% loan to value. I prefer flippers, six month term, one year term, whatever. You can typically charge a lender fee and get around 10% interest rate and you can be around 70%, 75% loan to value. In some cases you go 80%, whatever, um, in that realm, depends on what you're buying. Like if, if they're already buying under market value, it could potentially be 100% of purchase price, but that's still 80% loan to value. I know people who buy at such discounts, they bring me properties that are like, they're buying it for 200, it's worth 400 already. They have to put a little bit of money in it, maybe we'll make it worth 500. They kind of be asking for the whole purchase price. And I'm, I'm comfortable in some situations lending 100% of purchase price. That's still less than 75% loan to value. The reason for that is where can you get and I argue this is a risk-free return because where can you get, if the real estate market in Canada dropped 20%, the government would step in. Like, I'm more sure the banks will fail if my money's sitting in my checking account or the brokerage accounts will fail or the treasury bills will fail before we see a 35% or more pullback in real estate in Canada. That's how, it's in my mind, you know, lending private mortgage on a property, very similar risk profile to bonds, especially if you go out and you pick the lender, like you're the lender, right? So you go out and pick the borrower. You get to go out there and pick who you're lending to. So you can lend someone who has 10 properties and you could, you know, you could secure against their, their personal credit score. You could secure against their personal house if they defaulted on the other rental property. So they have assets you can go after. Plus the whole real estate market, you know, it's all propped up by government stimulus, right? The government steps in. Here in Canada, the majority of our GDP locally is generated through one way or another through real estate. Like all the home hardwares, all the contractors, all the lawyers, the accountants, the realtors, um, everything associated with the transactions of real estate, as well as actually just like physically improving real estate, um, you know, people living in houses and paying rent. It's a large portion of everything that's going on. So Canada just wouldn't let a 20, 30% correction happen. It just, they would step in. That I'm confident of. So I feel like it's a very, very low risk, but a great return. Like where can you get 10%, you know, compounded on itself and 10% compounded over, you know, 10 years is a, a double, you know, more than a double. It's like almost, almost a triple um, if you compound it, right? So that's, that's powerful. You know, the rule of 72 is you got every seven years, you get a double, right? At around 10% return. So that, that to me is super powerful. It doesn't have the same liquidity, but you can put in the contract that, you know, you, you have a set date of repayment or there's like a huge penalty, like a, your rate of return goes to like 15 or 20%. You can set crazy, um, you know, interest rate pieces if you wanted to, to ensure liquidity when you needed it. But I, I just, you know, I think it's a much better approach to generating fixed income as opposed to, you know, bonds or other fixed income vehicles that exist. The reason large funds don't go out and do this is because it's hard to find those opportunities in, again, at, at large amounts. Like you can't go out and find, you know, a thousand mortgages from quality, you know, borrowers with those sort of risk parameters at 10%. It's just, there's not enough of those people that exist. And then the underwriting process with that is, is quite difficult, right? So if you do it yourself or you go through a mortgage broker to do it and they do the underwriting for you, there are definitely some um, arbitrage things you can do to get a better return. And that's, that's what we're after. I think a lot of us who watch this, who watch my channel, enjoy my journey, we're about finding those opportunities for arbitrage so we can make a better return than market. And so, I don't know, I just love it. Okay, let's go to some of the questions here. I love it. Uh, one of them just popped up. Nice cottage. Hope you made. Yeah, you, I don't know if you guys can see it, but like, 
probably can't see it. Through those trees, I can see the whole lake. It doesn't look very clear from here, but I can't even see the caps of the waves right now. Um, I got the three kids down at the beach. We drove. Them, we have a, a mule that we drove down, so I drove them down at the, to the beach. I'm gonna walk down and play with them for a bit and then drive the mule back up. It's been fun. It's been great. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm really excited for the next full five weeks, I guess, um, until my new house comes together. But I don't know, there's something about, you know, um, there's something about being in the city too. I, I do like having those conveniences and I don't know if I would live out here all the time. I think I could do it for like six or eight weeks, but the internet's one thing, I just, I hate it. I'm trying to place a trade or I'm trying to check something out and it's like a four second delay. And that could be, you know, that's brutal. And I'm excited for my new place. So I couldn't stay here forever, but really enjoying it. Um, the other part of your question was talking about the new egg short. So as you guys know, um, two weeks back, I haven't shaved still, you guys can see. I've stayed true to my word. I haven't shaved at all. Um, not that I can really grow a full beard anyway, but, and not that you can really see it in the camera, but you know, anyway, um, it's super itchy for me. I, I hate it. I made a vow that l two weeks ago, Wednesday, there was that big uh, short squeeze that happened on Newegg. And I removed my hedge out of ego or, you know, you can go back and watch that episode about where I went wrong. Part of it was ego and, and part of it was just, you know, not knowing when to cut losses. But I removed my hedge and I became naked on that short. And I put orders in to buy a hedge and just never got my orders accepted. Kept adjusting, adjusting, adjusting. I should have just put a market order in and got it filled. But basically I got squeezed and um, shot up 100% in one day. Now, it was already above fair market value, like it was trading way above, that's how these meme stocks work sometimes, things go irrationally high. So I thought I could, you know, stay solvent longer than, um, you know, the market could stay irrational. And I was right, if you've watched the Newegg chart, it at tops of 78, it's trading now at 26, $27 a share, it still has ways down to go. It'll go back down to 18, 19, where I started shorting it around 18, 19, 20. Um, I, I'm confident of that. And my short, I, I stayed on it. If you've watched, if I didn't hedge, and I, by the way, I could have went to the moon, so I had to put my hedge back on, but my hedge cost me half a million dollars. So on the way back down, I've made back, so I made back the whole million and a half that I lost on the way back down because I've, you know, I played it all the way down. But I lost probably 700 grand in hedging. So I'm still down, yeah, almost 700 grand on the trade, which is horrible. Like it feels bad, but it's only been two weeks and the trade isn't finished yet. And I have plenty of other, you know, things, you know, what do they call them? Fishing lines out in the water. I'm not worried. It has evaporated a few months of, of options trading profit. I made a big mistake. It's lucky I didn't blow my whole account up. Um, I know now to never remove the hedge, to never try to time the market. You cannot time the market. Um, what you can do is nibble away on the down days at stuff you want to own long term using options contracts, that's a fantastic way to do it. If you, if I had really defined my risk properly, the way I'm, I'm now trading as a result of this, you know, million and a half dollar learning lesson, again, becoming cheaper and cheaper as I apply the learnings of that lesson, I'm gonna make back all that money. But that lesson, you know, I think I needed to have that lesson now um, to learn how to, you know, mitigate that risk. I think I should have, you gotta keep your vertical spreads super tight. You never remove your hedge, always have your stop loss. Risk mitigation is super important. And don't bet the farm. Yeah, you know, I say that all the time on this channel, but seriously, don't bet the farm. In a matter of minutes, my, um, my join me at a in AMC short if Neg falls first. Uh, so William, I actually do have a vertical bear call um, spread on AMC, which is effectively a defined short on AMC. I sold that yesterday, just before the close. And it's up a lot because it's down, what, six, 7% today. And in the options world, you know, premiums decay super fast. So I think I made like 40 per, 30 or 40%. I closed some of that out today. But uh, whenever I see things like irrationally high, I'll jump in with a super amount of defined risk. Again, uh, I think I sold like between 40 and 42 or something, or you know, 40 and 44, I think it was. And so uh, anything under 40 and I got the full premium. Um, so that's again, a, a situation where my risk is super defined. If, if AMC goes to the moon, who cares? If it was a thousand dollars a share, it doesn't affect me. I stop out at 44, 45 bucks a share. Um, that means my max loss is defined at three, four bucks a share. I'm okay with those types of um, short plays on garbage stocks. Like AMC is, is garbage. It's trading at multiples. It, it was really attractive at five, six bucks a share. Like even at three, four bucks a share. When it was at its lows, I'm like, 
okay, AMC has value here. Like, I love going to the movie theaters. I think that they have a lot of value. They're being beat up by everything that's been going on, but it will recover, maybe to $10 a share, but not 50, 60, 70, 80. That's just people in a euphoric FOMO um, type of irrational mentality that will eventually correct, right? The wind eventually comes out of the bag. And so anyway, um, to, to basically address your comment there, um, I just think that, you know, the, the market eventually corrects and it corrects to where intrinsic value um, lies. And, and maybe AMC with all the new attention and all the raised capital, maybe there'll be a situation where AMC is now worth 20 bucks a share intrinsically. And part of this whole pump and capital raise, you guys don't realize this, but AMC actually had a stock split too. I don't know if people follow. So it's really valued at, you know, if you look at relative to where it was, to where it is now, it's like, if they didn't do the stock split, it's like $200 a share for AMC right now. It's comparable to GameStop. Um, again, overvalued. New egg, again, overvalued. Still a little bit more to go before I exit my short. Um, I'm gonna see it through. Some of it is just time decay. Like some of it, you know, William, is just me waiting for the options contracts to decay. If it trades sideways and does nothing, even if it trades against me, the decay, like basically when you write an options contract, it's the time is unknown. We don't know what's gonna happen between now and the expiration of the contract. And if it doesn't go crazy, it just stays sidelined for the rest of the contract, I get all of that premium, all that money that I, on those contracts for nothing. Um, that's awesome. So I, that's what I like, because I go to sleep and my contracts all decay overnight. Like as long as it just moves sideways or slightly in the direction I move or slightly against me, it doesn't even matter, uh, I still win. And that's what I like better about defined options contracts as opposed to, um, you know, as opposed to just buying the shares, right? If I'm gonna buy the shares and tie up all that equity, because you gotta tie up a lot of equity to own the shares, right? Um, a lot of your margin gets it's tied up in that, right? If I'm gonna own the shares, hell, I'm gonna sell covered calls in them to generate some, some extra money, maybe be an extra 12% a year, percent a month, just by selling covered calls at, you know, a price I'm okay getting rid of my shares. Like, if you're like, hey, I own the shares in like, whatever, like TD at 70 bucks a share or whatever, I don't even know what TD is trading at, but probably high 60s right now. And you're like, hey, I'm okay selling TD at like 80 bucks a share. That's a nice profit, 20% profit. I'm cool with that. Um, you just start selling covered calls. You, you sell calls that are covered on those shares and you agree to give those shares away at 80 bucks. And if it goes up to 80 bucks, you have to give your shares away. No big deal, you locked in 20% gain and all that options premium for free. That's what I love about it. Um, I don't know, I just, just easier than, than real estate. Real estate's a lot more stressful, there's a lot. And I, I still have eight active flips on the go right now. Like I'm still actively flipping. It's not like I'm out of real estate. I just have partners who are in control of everything and I'm sort of the, um, the deal partner and the money partner. I do lean in occasionally to provide value, but I, mostly high level partner. And I, I still have a, a decent sized portfolio in real estate. I love real estate. Um, it built the wealth that I have now. It is, if you're starting right now with zero, options trading might be fun to like build the knowledge so that you're ready when you have a base of capital. But if you don't have a lot of capital, real estate's a way better way to get in. Like you can get into your first property at 5% down, right? Like you can get into a $200,000 property. There are trashy, you know, $200,000 properties in London still. Occasionally you'll find like a, a semi or, you know, in, in a rough area of town, you might find something for 200 to 300,000. You can get into that for 5% down. That's 15, $18,000 with closing costs. You're in it for 18 grand and you control a $250,000, $300,000 property. Those properties typically are distressed, so they need new floors and paint and everything else. You can put that effort into it, and now it's worth 350, let's say. And you just turn your 16 grand down payment into $100,000. Where can I, if you just join this channel, and you have, you're an able-bodied person, you can paint, and or you can learn to paint, you can lay floor, whatever, you can manage trades to do that. Um, that's gonna have the most significant impact on your wealth. If you're watching this right now, and you don't have a lot of capital, real estate's a fantastic vehicle to get started to build capital. There is no other vehicle I know better at building wealth than real estate, if you do it properly and you follow well, you know, the systems that people like me have used and already paved the way for you to do. There's nothing better, like with the risk profile associated because the chance of losing money on buying a distressed property is very low. Um, typically, you know, if you're, you're buying a distress and you fix it up, you've gained all that equity. So even if the market crashes in real estate, you can hold it in cash flow. Our strategy is buying stuff for the long term and cash flowing it. So you're making money every month, regardless of what the price of real estate does. Hopefully you can refinance it right after, pull some equity out. Now you've got no money in the deal. Where else can you invest in something, have no money in it and it pay you every month, right? You can't do that in the crypto space. If you have capital, okay. Like now we have a different conversation. 
about how to about wealth preservation, about growing that capital. I think real estate's difficult to scale well. Like if I had 10 or 20 million dollars, I wouldn't use real estate to grow it to 100 million. I might use real estate for 20% of that capital, but majority of that capital is going to go into buying private businesses. Might go into a little bit of crypto, um, definitely private businesses, and definitely some options trading to grow that. Right? I think the private businesses is the key. If you can find those opportunities, that's the key. Um, but yeah, let's go to the Q&A here for a sec. And let me know, by the way, if you guys can hear me because I am on like the slowest internet ever and hopefully the next few weeks it'll get better. Uh, currently the head and shoulders on the crypto sector that is forming is scaring me for a huge sell-off. So Michael, I don't know um, short term where the crypto space is going. It looks like we're trending, you know, we're trending down, right? Um, there is some bearish sentiment around the cryptocurrency space, except for today. Today we had 10%, you know, uplift. Um, I don't think that's going to become a trend straight up, just having a look at the, the sticks and the charts. But five years from now, I'm extremely bullish on the crypto space. And I love, you know, if you guys watch some of the stuff even today with people talking um, like Kathy, Elon, and, and Jack, a um, little, little bit Bitcoin uh, conference they had today. I think that, you know, five, 10 years from now, there's tremendous value in the same way that in 2000, we had a, we had a pop in the internet bubble and no one knew you know if there was going to be the internet right i think the internet is the same way as cryptocurrency i think that it, for a long time i was resistant to it because there wasn't the widespread adoption and i didn't see the use cases i now i'm starting to see the use cases the tech is starting to catch up where i see huge value in decentralized finance i generally have a disdain especially with i think it might have even been going through this pandemic and seeing how governments in the world treated certain situations I've become very, I got a bad taste in my mouth when it comes to a lot of the different na national governments and decentralized finance puts the control back in the hands of the people. And it, crypto helps most the people who have wealth, massive amounts of wealth, they can shelter it. The government can't come in and seize your bank accounts in times of war or seize your bank accounts in times of pandemic. They can't impose a 50% uh, a tax, right? It's just, um, <laughs> what's up, Mike? You look bright today. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm wearing a super white shirt against a, a backdrop with, um, you know, maybe it's, I don't even need this light on. I don't know. Let's turn this down a little bit. Is that better? If I turn off, I have a, a lamp here behind my screen. If I turn that off, it, yeah, the sun's still reflecting off my shirt. It doesn't matter. Um, Train of thought now on cryptocurrency. I don't know what the, the bottom is. You know, we're at January pricing right now on Ethereum and, and Bitcoin and whatever. So people have asked for a time machine to go back. This is the opportunity to to buy in. However, crypto could, you know, I think we could see resistance levels in the low 20,000s for Bitcoin as an example. I continue to mine it. Um, I continue to be enthusiastic about building businesses around that to support it. I think that some of the applications and layers built to help enable a new crypto space are going to have huge growth potential long-term. And so I'm super bullish about that. But can I pick one horse? No, I think that it's hard to pick which cryptocurrency is going to flourish and which one maybe isn't even created yet that has the best use cases of all. We, we don't know. Um, but it's gonna revolutionize the, the world, I think, in a lot of ways. And I'm extremely happy about the understanding that if there's a world, you know, collapse or something, I don't have to worry about the government coming in and seizing my bank accounts and, you know, just deciding it's their wealth now. Like, hey, 55% of the people are suffering and that's all it takes is for a majority. The 55% get together and say, hey, let's take from the top 45%. Um, we have nothing. Let's take from those who have. And all of a sudden, you could be a mass equalization of wealth. I'm seeing, you know, a big disparity in the wealth gap as it continues to grow. Um, tons of inequality, um, government reaching or overreaching a lot of their constitutional uh, allotted power. I see, you know, just a lot of things happening in the space that makes me nervous. I don't know if I'll be in Canada in 10 or 20 years. And I like that I can move between currencies and between nations using crypto. Uh, I think there's a lot of great use cases as well to just be more efficient than our current centralized financing system. Like to move money, it's just not efficient. Um, humans have to do checks and balances. There's 
it's just slow to, to, to batch you know, transactions through credit cards. It's not secure. Um, there's a number of drawbacks to fiat and fiat you know, over time tends to depreciate. There's you know, a target of two to 3% of inflation every year. So the goal, the government wants your money to lose two to 3% value every single year. Now this year we're seeing you know, 10, 20% annualized inflation, which means your dollar's losing a lot of power. Um, they're talking about next year being a deflationary year. So potential where the US dollar could actually um, be gaining more value over time, right, relative to other currencies and, and whatnot, and having more buying power. That'll be an interesting environment, right, where the dollar, you actually don't wanna spend your dollars because they're actually going up in value, where it's deflationary in nature. That's really bad for equity markets because you can't raise capital when everyone's afraid to let their capital go because they let go of their capital go, it's gonna be worth more tomorrow. And the next day it's worth even, has even more buying power. And as your dollars have more buying power, um, no one wants to invest and the economy grinds to a halt and then we go back into hyperinflation, right? Or actually it tends to result, if you look through the economics of it, into a hyperinflationary environment. I like, you know, regardless of, of uh, you know, whether Bitcoin's the one or not, I like that it has a finite supply of it. Um, I like what's going on with the smart contract stuff. Um, I like that you can basically own it and lend it, lend it out to provide liquidity to exchanges and so forth using smart contracts. You can lend it out at between like six and 10%. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, more stable, like six, 7%. But I like that. You can hold the Bitcoin, have that appreciation, maybe some depreciation in the short term. I don't know. Who knows? Like 10 years from now, Bitcoin could be $500,000 a coin. It's, it's possible. It could also be $20,000 a coin. Uh, there's so much volatility and uncertainty, I don't know. Uh, maybe something better comes out. I don't think it's likely. I think that the widespread market adoption and institutional capital now flowing into Bitcoin and Ethereum and the use cases around Ethereum, as an example, make it vi valuable long-term. I am personally betting on Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, as well as some other you know, smaller alt currencies with very little amounts of my capital. But who knows? You know, I'm not betting the whole farm. I'm, I'm putting a little bit in, I'm dabbling, I'm... Um, yeah, I don't want to miss out if things do you blow up. I do like having the ability to move it between currencies. I like that there's no uh, currency issues. I would like to do business in crypto. The problem is the, the volatility makes it hard to do business in. Like, I'd love to just, oh, ow. sorry, just kick the table. You know, I'd love the opportunity to do business in it, but it's so hard if, you know, let's say I, I raised capital for a project and let's say I, I borrowed like $10,000 for you know, some real estate project or something. And, you know, it, it tripled in value. I have to now pay that, and I, I had to convert to fiat to fund the project, right? Because everything's done in fiat. And I had to pay that person back in Bitcoin, and it's four times. So I had to pay them back 400% return. Um, that's difficult to swallow. So that's why people don't do business in crypto yet. They do it in stable coins like USDT and USDC, um, which mimic and follow the US dollar. Um, so you can do it in the crypto, you know, platform in a decentralized manner. But again, there's, there's an unlimited supply because they can follow the US dollar, dollar for dollar. There is a, um, there's an inherent risk there when you can print as much of it as you want. And it, it loses some of the stores of value and other um, pros of something like Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's also burning too of, of things like Bitcoin, right? People lose their wallets and that, if you have a hard physical wallet with no recovery and you lose that, that crypto, you could have a Bitcoin on there and it's gone forever. That Bitcoin is gone. If you dropped it to the bottom of the sea and it got swallowed by a fish and then buried underground, no one's ever finding that, it's gone. Or you drop it in fire and it melts and you, have no, and you, burn, the, you burn the recovery keys, it's gone. Like, or you lost the recovery keys in a move. It happens, people lose lots. So the, the actual Bitcoin supply is a lot smaller than people actually think it is. And so that's something that's valuable about it as a store of value. Whereas with gold, you can continue to print more, right? Or not, not print more, but mine more. Um, so I actually like Bitcoin over gold as a store of value. I never traditionally liked gold because it didn't cash flow. But you can hold Bitcoin the same way as gold and lend it out. And it can cash flow and you still get all the appreciation. You own the Bitcoin. If it goes up 10, 100%, whatever, like a million percent, you get all that appreciation plus the interest. That's what I like. If Bitcoin drops, you still get the interest. All good. Um, it does provide cash flow. So that's what I like about you know, crypto. Um, there's other things too that I like about crypto. I'm just sort of ranting. Um, who cares what I think, right? Uh, what do you guys think? Tell me in the comments what you guys think. Colton, good to see you on. Glad you could catch the live stream. Um, Some talk about active trading. I answered this question already, Harriet. Um, outperforming the index. So, I mean, 
There are tax advantages, one, which is great. Um, it is treated better than just buying um, the index if it's in a corp. Uh, two, I do think that there are opportunities to make tremendous amounts of value if you know what you're doing. I'm not pretending that I'm smarter than the average. I am probably smarter than the average. Like the average retail, you know, DIY person on Robinhood who's like got AMC, GameStop, and like some shares in Bank of Nova Scotia. Sure, I'm more sophisticated than that person. And I can make money off them being an idiot. Um, but for the most part, like Wall Street has algorithms and access to more information than I do. So really, I just sort of trade by the, the saying, I'm bullish when everyone else is fearful and I'm fearful when everyone else is bullish. That's typically been my trading philosophy. I like to own quality names. I think that, you know, long term, there's going to be appreciation across the whole market and I'm bullish on having a, a diversified portfolio of, you know, a hundred great names. I just like to build my own. I have enough capital to build my own fund. I can look at what's in the best funds and say, I like these ones. I don't like this one. And I can pick what I like and build my own portfolio. 80% um, of it's in stable stuff that's super safe. 20% of it is in, uh, is in those, those high risk things that can be, you know, 10, 20, 30 times growth. And I, I think crypto can be one of those um, spaces you can invest in. There are companies in those spaces that you can invest in. Okay, um, next question. Hey, Mike, I really enjoy your show. Thanks, thanks, Port City. He says, I have about 100,000 equity in a burr. Should I do a cash or refinance or a HELOC? Manual Life's offering a interesting HELOC that can be broken down into sub accounts. Yeah, I've heard of some of the stuff that, that they can do and it's cool, it's like an all-in-one account where as you put money in your checking account, it pays down the balance automatically in the mortgage, which I'm bearish, I'm paying down 2% debt that can't be non-callable debt. So debt that can never be margin called, even in recessions, that's at a 2% fixed cost. That to me is, if you're on a five-year fixed term or something, that to me is super, super um, attractive debt that you want to have on your balance sheet. So I don't want to pay that debt down. Um, that said, if it's a rental property already, you're deducting all the interest anyway, no matter what, when you refinance it, even if you put the capital to work somewhere else. So there's no... Like with your personal primary residence, there's an argument to the Smith maneuver about using a HELOC to draw extra equity out of your house and then make it tax deductible. That makes sense. Um, however, it doesn't make the same sense on a rental property because the rate of interest on a HELOC is higher, it's variable, not fixed, and you typically get a lower loan to value. You can do a hybrid product where it's part fixed mortgage, part um, variable home equity line of credit or HELOC, and you can go 80% loan to value in some situations. Yes, I think you should pull the capital out. I think any idle capital that you can access at 2% cost of debt non-callable is capital you should be accessing. So pull the equity out. The only reason I would say not to do it would be the effort you know, to go through with the financing process. So if there's some reason why borrowing that extra debt might mess up you refinancing your personal house or something to that effect, right? But I try to borrow as much as I can. I'm, I refinanced all my properties last year and the market's gone crazy since then. I'm unfortunately, I have several million dollars in equity again in my portfolio across my properties. And the amount of work it is for me to refinance them all one at a time, because the bank only do, only look at one at a time, uh, is just, it's a year of work and setting all the leases in and the anal probing through my bank accounts. That's part of why I haven't refinanced some of the equity out of my properties, but I typically do it um, as soon as the equity is available that it's, it, it's worthwhile. So in my case, as soon as I'm like 30% paid down, I wanna go back to refinance 80% loan to value. In some cases now, because of the appreciation we've had, I have properties that I refinanced last year and they're probably 45% you know, uh, down payment right now. So 55% loan to value mortgages on there, which is terrible. I don't want that. That's a terrible return on my capital. You know, my cash flow, let's say I make a thousand bucks a month or something in cash flow from my refinance last year. That's a terrible return to trap, you know, half, like some of these properties have several hundred thousand dollars in equity in them and they're generating a thousand dollars a month. Like that's, without appreciation, in the current cap rate environment in London, Ontario, it isn't that attractive for the amount of work involved. Like it is, I guess, if you're gonna do the work yourself, you're gonna manage the property yourself, you don't value your time at more than $100 an hour. Let's say you, you make 20, 30 bucks an hour, you make 40, 50 grand a year, 60 grand a year. Okay, like rental property business makes sense. You're making more money per hour. Even if you're making 80 grand a year or less, rental properties make sense. If you're a high income earner with high valuable time, it makes no sense at all. 
to manage your own properties. It makes no sense at all to have a lot of equity trapped in a property. Sell the property off, free that capital up, and redeploy it in even just private lending. You'll make a higher return in many cases um, than, than continuing to hold the property, right? And assuming we don't have a crazy appreciation um, pop off again, I don't think we will. I think we've kind of reached a bit of a pullback actually. We're seeing a bit of a pullback and a bit of a correction in real estate right now. Not drastic, like Canadian real estate is very sticky. We don't see major pullbacks. Um, even though we saw 40% appreciation, we won't see a 40% correction. It just Canadian prices are sticky. Canadians just, they wanna own a house and a cottage. They will hold their house. There's no reason to sell. Interest rates are not that high. The government can't afford to raise interest rates. So there isn't a catalyst to, and mortgages are, are non-recourse here as well. Um, or sorry, recourse here versus non-recourse. So meaning that people can't just walk away from their houses. So you don't get that snowball that happened in the US. It doesn't happen in Canada because of recourse versus non-recourse mortgages. I touched on three streams ago, I think it was. Um, so just for a number of reasons, Canadian real estate doesn't crash in the same way, which is why, again, I love private lending against Canadian real estate. Against US real estate, I'm not interested in doing the private lending. There's too much risk in that market uh, comparatively to what we have here. Okay. I'm gonna try to blast some of these questions out. Um, Mike, if you're building real estate today with single family dwellings, how would you choose what type of houses to invest in? All else being equal, would you rather a house on a busy main street, downtown, suburb, rural? Um, Panda, so when I started investing, I was only comfortable owning in location, location, location. So I didn't, like my peers were buying in Old East Village and you know downtown and in the rougher areas. I was afraid of those areas initially. My first 10 properties were all in the north and the west and just like west and north of downtown in good areas near the universities. I was comfortable with having the option of a student rental for extra cash flow or a family rental if I wanted to. Always having a backup target tenant, not just being reliant on you know just Airbnb or just student rental. I like to have multiple options when I was investing to protect against downside. Um, I was very conservative. I didn't know if the market would appreciate, but I was very, very focused on, you know, it's really important to make sure that you protecting is your downside. And I think buying in the crappier areas, they may have more cash flow initially, like the price makes more sense buying in like the ghetto where all the houses are really rough um, and the tenant profile is terrible, but you get a lot more headaches and a lot more risk. And over time, the A locations appreciated faster and better. So that's something to think about. Um, but if I had to do it again, my strategy when I built my portfolio in a, in a big way, once I already had a dozen properties and I decided to go from a dozen to 50, I was like, what is the best way to scale this? In hindsight, I wish I only bought every property under $200,000 in London, Ontario. Anything under replacement value, I was like, buy, 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 buy. Any, like there were so many houses in London, Ontario and East, all over the place. We could buy semis and just detach small houses that were two and three bedroom houses. Those are the best because the exit strategy is investor or family or first time home buyer. There's so many people that can buy at that price point um, as well. They were selling at like the build cost to build a detached three bedroom house was like three, $400,000 new. And these properties were a little bit beat up, but if I could buy stuff with good bones at 200, the land was free. And so when you're buying parcels of land in London, Ontario at zero, that's huge. Um, that's, you know, to me, that that is still a good strategy. And there are still properties today, less and less, but I still see properties that come up that are trading way below replacement cost. We get the land for free. Those are smashing buys, especially if you can buy them in good areas where you're the worst house on the best street, that's the best situation. You wanna be the crappiest house in the nicest area. You get great comps around you. You can improve the property to then comp or compare against those other comparable properties and then get that, that equity lift. But in recessions or, or bad times, I wanna be lending against good quality properties in good locations. I also wanna be, um, like they're just more desirable and they're easier to sell. Oh, super chat. Thanks, Michael G. Um, I'm gonna do your question first because if you super chat, you support this channel. I now turn the ads off completely. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but there are zero ads at all. 